So in, in, uh, we're in Acts chapter 24, and if you would uh, look at verse 10, it says there, uh, then after the Paul, and then Paul, after that the governor had beckoned unto him to speak and answer, speak and answer. For as much as I know that thou hast been uh, of many years a judge in this nation, I do more cheerfully the answer for myself. So Paul here is making his case. He's defending himself, and I really don't want to go a whole lot into the context. I'm really just going to focus in on one phrase here towards the end there in, in, in verse 15. But if you know the story, Paul, you know he's been arrested uh, by the Jews. They're accusing him. He's being drugged in front of the governor, so on and so forth. And he's making his case, and he says in verse, teen, verse 15, And have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. So in his defense, he's explaining the fact that I believe and I have hope, just as these people do, the Jews, the Pharisees, that there shall be a resurrection from the dead. So even the Jews, you know, that these people that are falsely accusing him, uh, of being, you know, uh, someone who's call, causing insurrection and trying to, you know, cause a tumult and, you know, uh, you know, a rebellion of sorts. Even they are going to agree with Paul on this point that there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. And I want to talk to us this morning about that resurrection and specifically this phrase that he uses there: the resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. That's the title of the sermon this morning: the resurrection of the just and the unjust. And right away, what we should un understand is that there is going to be a resurrection. And that, is a, that in and of itself is a very profound truth. That one day we are going to, when we pass away and our body is put in this grave, we understand that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, that our spirit will go and be with the Lord. But that one day when Christ returns, he's going to resurrect also our physical body and actually make it even, give us a glorified body, a new body in Christ which is another amazing truth we'll talk about here in a, for a little minute. But that is something that we need to think about. You know, we often as Christians, we think about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we believe that. You know, you can't, you can't be saved and going to heaven if you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is, you know, a major component of the gospel, believing in the resurrection. But sometimes I think as Christians, we get, we're, we're, you know, we get a little short-sighted. We get so wrapped up in the affairs of this life, in the, the cares of this world, that we forget what lies ahead for us. And sometimes we look around and we see what's going on and we get real down and depressed and we can get, you know, feel downtrodden and kind of wondering, you know, what's the point of it all? Kind of an attitude. And we can get, you know, a little down in the mouth, as they say. But here's something that we should think about, is the fact that we have a hope in Christ called the resurrection. Now, this resurrection applies, as Paul says there, both of the just and the unjust. And the reason why he says that is that there's actually a, a, this term, the resurrection of the dead, is an event that it's, it's a term that refers to two separate events. It's the same thing, you know, it's the resurrection, it's the body being reunited with the soul, we understand that. But actually there's two instances of this that's, that's going to take place in the future that regard mankind. There's the resurrection of the just, and then there's the resurrection of the unjust. Now, the resurrection of the just, those are people who are saved. We you know, all understand that, that we're justified in Christ, that we have justification through his blood, that we're saved, we're justified. That, that is us. We are the resurrection of the just. You know, if you're saved, if you put your faith in Christ this morning, you are going to take part in that resurrection, the resurrection of the just. Now, it doesn't mean you're just because you live such a good life or that you've just been such an upstanding person. You know, we assume that everyone does that. You know, we try our best to do that. But we're, 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 the, we're take part in the resurrection of the just, not because of our deeds, but by Christ's deeds, by his righteousness. We are made just in Christ. We're justified in him. And then there's, of course, the resurrection of the unjust, which would be those that are unsaved, those that are going to be judged according to their works and found wanting. So the resurrection of the just is those, the saved, who have died. And, you know, sometimes people get a little confused about when he says the resurrection of the dead, and they think, well, that only applies to the unsaved. And that's not true. And the reason why they think that is because the Bible often refers to those that have died in Christ as those who are asleep. And if you would, go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So when he says, you know, the resurrection of the dead, when we say somebody is dead, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're unsaved. Okay? And a lot of people think that they get confused and they think, well, I thought we always said that when people died in Christ that they're just asleep. But we don't even really use that terminology. And in even the Bible, you know, Paul says 
says it both ways. That those that have died in Christ are dead. And he also says that those that have died in Christ are asleep. And, you know, the reason why, you know, it's, it's so right there we understand that, you know, this using this term of those that are dead in Christ have gone to sleep. That's not a really, a, if I were to say that today, you know, that would make a lot of sense to a lot of people. If I were to, if you were to say, you know, if some relative were mine to pass away, and then you were to, you know, and you didn't know, and you asked them, you said, hey, how's so-and-so doing? I said, well, he's, he's asleep. You'd assume he's at home taking a nap. You wouldn't think, oh, you had a funeral, you put him in the ground, he died. You know, you wouldn't counsel me, you know. <laughs> you wouldn't try to comfort me over the fact that he's, you'd think, oh, he's taking a nap. Well, good for him. You might say something like, oh, great, I'm glad to hear it. I'm jealous, you know, I wish I was sleeping, you know. <laughs> but here's the thing, you know, the, so uh, the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, this, ter this term of sleeping or dead, this can apply to, the, both of these terms can apply to the believer. Now, you would not say that about somebody who is unsaved, in the, and you don't see that in the scripture, that those that are dead without Christ, they are not asleep. Okay, because because when you're when you're saved, when you're when you're taking part in the resurrection, of the just, you know, death to you is like a sleep. Now, just look there in First Thessalonians chapter four, and Paul uses that term of sleeping or being dead in Christ as a way to comfort people. It kind of gives us perspective. Okay, that's the why. That's why he even uses that term. Okay, it's not because they're they're, you know, I, we call it a dirt nap, right? But that's not because they're sleeping. They are actually dead. We just use that term as a form of, a source of comfort, okay, to give perspective. He says in verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians 4, But I would not have you be ignorant, to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. So he's trying to comfort them, because he goes on and says, That ye sorrow not, even as the others which have no hope. He, you know, so he's using this term of, you know, they're asleep, to try and, you know, break this to them gently, to remind them that they have a hope in Christ, that those that have died in Christ before us and have gone on, to, to be there with the Lord in glory, you know, that, that we, we need to look at their passing on as nothing more than just asleep. As, as, it's as if they are, they're just sleeping, and one day they will be awakening, and that we'll be reunited with them. So that's how he's using that term, because he goes on and says in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even some though them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So you see how he's using that term to sleep in this particular context to comfort these people you know sometimes we do the same thing with like kids and stuff you know when they don't understand fully death and everything like that you know we'll have an, uh, an elderly relative that dies you know we'll say something well you know they went to heaven we'll say something like that they're they're with the lord we want to say well they're dead now you know because that's kind of a that's kind of a harsh you know i want to say it's a harsh term but it's very it could be very cold you know in some instances you know we, we use terms like they passed away they went on to be with the Lord. They've gone to glory. They went home. You know, these are the things that we say about those in Christ. As a, these are terms that we use to, to comfort one another with these words. And the word sleep here is another way, to, another term that we can use to comfort one another with these words. Because when, you were, when you're saved, when you, ha you have this hope in Christ, that even though you, uh, someone you know and love uh, and dies in Christ, that one day you're going to be reunited with them. That's a source of hope for us. But notice there how, even in this context, died and sleep are still used to describe the same thing, right? Did you catch that? He says in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus slept, no, that Jesus died. So the sleeping means that they died. That he died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, or are dead in Jesus, or died in Jesus. So, you know, I want to kind of clarify that, because sometimes people get confused about that. They think, well, you know, the resurrection of the dead, that refers only to, you know, people and, and that, are, that are unsaved. You know, the resurrection of the dead, as Paul pointed out, is of the just and the unjust. You can refer to those that have died in Christ as dead, just as easy as you could those that are without Christ. But you could not say that those that are without Christ are asleep. It's something that only applies to the Christian because we have that hope that we will rise again. And notice also here, we're going to move on, that how they which are asleep in Jesus are both with him and will rise again. Okay? Now, look at verse 15. He says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, 
that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, those that have died in Christ. Okay? For the Lord shall descend from heaven without a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet them in the, Lord, in, in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these, with these words. So notice there, he's saying, look, when we, are, when we are alive, if we remain unto the coming of the Lord, the rapture, okay, that we're not going to prevent those which are asleep. That, meaning that we're not going first. We're not going to prevent them. We're not, you know, you, you know, it'd be like we're not cutting in line. You know, if I were to prevent you from, you know, if we went to some, you know, if we went to some, uh, you know, taco stand, which, you know, which isn't too far-fetched around here, and I said, hey, I'm going to prevent you. I'm going first. You know, I'm preventing you from going ahead of me. But he's saying here, we're not going to prevent them which are asleep. That, what is he saying? That they're going to arise first. For the Lord shall descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, right? So he's saying at the resurrection, before we're caught up together in the, to be with the Lord in the air, that the dead are going to be, caught, are going to be raised again and, and, and brought to the Lord. But notice in verse 14, it also said this, If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So not only are the dead rising to meet with God, those that are asleep are being risen again to, 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 to ahead of us to meet the Lord there, but they're also with him. You say, well, what's going on here? Well, like Paul said, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We know that man is both body, soul, and spirit. You know, that this physical, this vessel that we inhabit, this is just a vehicle that our, our soul lives in in order to interact with this physical realm. You know, that we are, there's a separate part of us, a spiritual part of our, our being that, you know, we can't really fully comprehend because we're, we're in this physical realm. But he's saying, look, the soul is going to come with Jesus. That, that, that part of them that have died is going to come with them. The souls that have died in Christ, they're with him right now. You know, that's the hope that we have. They're with him right now. When he returns, he's bringing them with him. Then the dead in Christ, those which sleep in Jesus, their body is going to be resurrected and reunited with their spirit, their soul. And then we, you know, then we which are alive and remain uh, shall be caught up to the Lord with the Lord near, which is a, a profound thought when you think about the fact that there's going to be a group of people that never die. Their body is never going to go through death. They're, when the Lord comes, they're going to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And, and, and then they're going to be made uncorruptible in Christ. We hope that's us, right? We, 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 that part we really like, but remember that those are also the people that went through the tribulation and so on and so forth. There's a, you know, it comes at a price, okay? But uh, <clears throat> we'll move on here. So we see, first of all, you know, that the, the term sleep is something that refers only to the, the resurrection of the just. The term dead can refer to either, and that, uh, we are, that the resurrection is going to take place when? When Christ returns, when he comes back. <clears throat> and immediately precedes the rapture, right? Again, look at verse 15. He says, For this we say unto you by the, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive remain unto the coming of the Lord. That is the rapture, okay? That's when this whole thing takes place. It immediately precedes the rapture. And what is it? If you would, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What is the resurrection? It is a reuniting of the flesh and the spirit. It's when the body and the flesh are reunited and made one again. And you say, well, what about people who have been cremated? You know, you know God... Listen, God's, God gives life to, to, to uh, he's the, he is the author of life, right? He's the one that, you know, knit us together in our mother's womb. He's the one that, you know, saw our substance before we were even born. God knit us together. He, he can make us, look, if, if someone gets burned up and their ashes scattered in several different parts of the world, as often happens these days, you know, God can still gather that all together again. It's not beyond him. If he can make life out of nothing, you know, he can easily just, Bring all those parts back together. Now, you know, that kind of leads me to the top. This is, sermon really isn't about that, you know, um, you know, what we should do with people's remains when they pass on. You know, I, I definitely think that it's, that's a matter of personal preference, but I do believe that it's a good testimony 
to bury somebody. I don't believe cremation is something Christians, uh, for testimony's sake, should be partaking in. And it's unfortunate today because the cost of burying people, it, it, it's, like, it's like they want to make money off of you every step of the way. I mean, they make money off of you when you're born. They make money off of you through your childhood, your working years, your old age. And even when you die, you know, you're not even around, but they're still going to profit off of your corpse by, you know, charging thousands of dollars for a casket and a service and everything else. You know, and, and, and gone are the days when, at least in this country, where you could just, you know, put somebody in a pine box and bury them on the back 40, you know. And, uh, but, but you know what? So people often are, op are opting for the convenience and the inexpense of just cremating somebody. Which, you know, I don't think if you do something like that, you know, you've somehow messed with the resurrection, you know, but it's a picture, you know, that, if, if, you know, if, an ear, you know if, a, if a corn die and go into the ground, it yieldeth much fruit, that it's going to be raised again. You know, that we, we are sown in, cor in corruption, but we're raised in incorruption, right? So it's a picture, it's, it's a, when we bury ourselves, it's because we're, we're showing that we're expecting to be raised again, that that body, we're not done with that body, that God is going to you know, open the graves one day. That's kind of a separate subject, but it ties in. So it's a reuniting with the flesh and spirit. That's what the resurrection is of the just and of the unjust. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 39. It says, All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another of beasts, another of fishes, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. So celestial is referring to heavenly. right? This, we refer to the stars as celestial beings. And then the terrestrial, like terra firma, terrestrial. That's talking about the earth. You know, there's a body that's in heaven. There's, there's heavenly bodies. That's one kind of flesh. And then there's another kind that inhabits the earth. You know, and that's the kind that we have. We have that terrestrial body right now. But one day we're going to receive a celestial body. You know, and it's going to be, you know, Jesus, when he was resurrected, said, he said, a, a spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see me to have. Meaning that he had flesh and bone. But it's also interesting that, he's, that he didn't mention in the blood because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven, right? So, yes, he had flesh and bone, but he did not have flesh and blood because, because you know, and I'm kind of going off on a little bit of a, you know, sidetrack here, but when you think about it, the Bible says that the life of the, of the flesh is in the blood, that the blood is the life. You know, that's what keeps us going right now. And, but here's the thing, when you're resurrected, you know, you're given a new, you're, you're, you're born again, you're saved. The blood is no longer the life. Okay, and I, there's, it's kind of hard to explain all that. We don't understand it, but we know that that's, that, that that's the case, that Christ is our life, that he, when we're given that glorified body, that celestial body, that doesn't seem like there's going to be any need for a, you know, cardiovascular system, you know, that, that, that there's not going to be any blood involved, okay? That's an interesting thought, you know. Again, we see through a glass darkly, a lot of these things were just told we don't understand how, but we just know this is what the Bible says. This is what we see in Scripture. This is the way it is. And he says, look, there is a bot there is a, there is a, uh, uh, also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. There's a heavenly body. There's an earthly body. There is one glory of the sun, another of the moon, another of the stars. For one star differeth from one star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Meaning this terrestrial body is going to be put in the ground, but one day when it's risen again, it's going to be incorrupt. It's going to have that celestial body. It's not going to have the, the sin. It says there, it is sown in dishonor. You know, our flesh wars against our spirit. You know, we're, it's a, it, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, the Bible says. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. Do you see how he's talking about, hey, it's, it's, it's sown in dishonor, there's a, there's a terrestrial, there's a celestial, it's sown in dishonor, it's raised in honor. He's saying, like, he's saying this, at the resurrection of the just, there's going to be a change of the body. You know, and it's not going to, I'm sure that we're going to have some resemblance of, of this, of what we look like. We're gonna, probably going to be able to tell who we are. And no, we're not Ruckmanites. We don't believe that everybody's going to be a 30-year-old white male. <laughs> it's crazy that people believe this kind of nutty stuff. We're going we're to recognize one another, you know. 
But we're going to have, there is going to be a change there. It's going to be glorified. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There's a difference here, okay? There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So when this resurrection of the just takes place, not only are we going to be with the Lord, not only are we going to be reunited with lost loved ones, or excuse me, uh, not lost loved ones, saved loved ones who have gone on before us, you know, we're going to meet those. We're going to be reunited with the friends that we had here, the people that we are, the fellow Christians that we knew on this earth. What, I mean, that alone is a wonderful thought. To think about that this life, that this is all there is to it. That there is life beyond the grave, and it's a much better one than this, in fact. That it's with the Lord, that it's in heaven. And on top of all of that, you also get a new glorified body. And this is something that I think about you know, time to time, and every time I do, you know, it really blows me away to think about what the hope that we have in Christ. Because when we have that spiritual body, you have to understand, we understand a little bit about what that's going to look like. And if you would, go over to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Because here's the thing, when you have that spiritual body, that body is going to have the abilities of the resurrected Christ. We're going we're gonna to be like Him. And we see it. We get a glimpse, just a glimpse of what that's like, you know, in the book of Acts, toward the latter end of the Gospels. We get to understand just a few things. You know, and Paul said that he beheld things in heaven that were not lawful for him to speak. We, we can't understand, you know, and I kind of like that it's that way. I kind of, it's, it reminds me, it's like the best Christmas present there is. You know, part of the great thing about the Christmas, you know, the presents and stuff, is the anticipation of what's in that package. You know, now as you become an adult, you, you know what's in the package because you're the one who bought it, right? <laughs> but as a child, you're looking at it, you're going, man, what is this? And you're trying to guess, you know, which can go wrong. I had an aunt, she guessed all of her presents one year. She picked it up, she'd shake it, and she knew everything that she'd gotten. And she's proud to never do it again, right? But with the resurrection, with what's going to take place in heaven, you know, we want to know these things, we want to understand these things, and God just gives us a hint. You know, it's bigger than a bread box, or, you know, it's, you know, whatever the hints that he, that, that he gives. He gives us just a little glimpse of what that body is going to be like, and from what little we see, it's quite amazing, okay? You're there in First John chapter 2, look at verse 1, he said, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. I mean, God could have just stopped there. God could have said, look, I'm going to save you, and when you die, you can come to heaven, but you're going to keep that old carcass. You're going to, you're going to be just like you were on earth. You know, he'll clean you up a little bit, get this, you know, you won't have all that sin. But look, God goes beyond that. You know, not only be the sons of God, not only are you going to inherit the earth, he says, therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him, him not, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. It's like, look, we don't fully understand what we're going to be. We, we don't know anybody that has, has a glorified body. We haven't seen it. We don't know what it's like. But we know that when he shall appear, the Lord, we shall be like him. That's why it says we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That's what that change is is when this incorruption puts, or this corruption puts on incorruption. When this mortality puts on immortality. When we receive that new body. That we are going to be like Him. Not only did God love us, not only does God save us, but then He also gives us a body like the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's amazing. We shall, for we shall see Him as He is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. You know, that's a good reason for us to keep ourselves pure. You know, that's the motive there. That's what he says. Look, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. That because, why? Because we shall see him as he is. You know, if we would just stop and contemplate that thought and think a little bit more about the fact that one day we are going to stand before God, that we're going to see him. With, with our eyes, we're going to lay out, we're, we're not going to have to wonder whether Jesus was this color or that color. We're going to know. We're going to have to wonder what, what he looked like. Now, we know a few things that, that, you know, he certainly didn't have the long hair they all want to make him out to have, right? But we're going to know all that. 
I mean, we're going to be able to look at him and see him. And he's going to be magnificent. And it's going to be quite the thing. Now, if we would just think about that, the fact that one day you're going to stand before God, you know, that might affect the way you behave yourself on this earth. It might cause you to want to purify yourself, to live a clean, godly life. You know, we always get accused of that. You know, oh, you preach uh, that easy believism. And you're telling people they can live however they want. And you know what? That's true. We do. Because believing is easy. And, you know, it's not by works of righteousness that we are saved, but by His grace He saved us. We're saved by grace and not of works. Amen. It doesn't matter how we live our life. You know, as far as going to heaven, we'll suffer the consequences of, of sin on this earth. But isn't it funny that though we preach that, yet the, some of the, just the most godliest people who are living the cleanest lives are the people that believe that. And why is that? Is it because they're trying to earn their way to heaven? No. And it isn't funny that the people who teach that you've got to earn your way to heaven are often the ones living the most wicked lives. You know, I think of how many different Catholics I've known over the years that have just lived, just, they're, you know, they're out drinking, they're smoking, committing adultery, they're doing everything the world does. But then they're sitting there and saying, and you've got to work your way to heaven. It's like, what a miserable existence. Good luck with that. Hope, let me know how that works out for you. Because from what I'm seeing, it's not going too well. You aren't trying very hard. You know, the, the score isn't, isn't looking good for you. But yet, it's funny that we teach that it's not of works. And yet, you see so many people that believe that living the godliest lives. Now, why is that? Because they, they do it out of love. Because they want to, because they understand God, you know, you know, behold what manner of love God, the, the, the Father hath bestowed upon us. You know, we're moved by God's grace to want to live for him. And then we understand that we're going to have this glorified body, that we're going to see Christ as he is. That moves us to live a more pure life. That causes us to purify ourselves. At least it ought to. Go over to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. <clears throat> now, God loves us and he's going to give us this this resurrected body, this incorruptible flesh, this glorified form that is after the image of his son, what Christ has. And because of that, we're going to have some of the abilities that Christ had, you know, uh, on this earth. And again, he gives us just a glimpse. And when you talk about this stuff, you know, people laugh and they, they think that it sounds crazy, but it's true. And the problem is today that, you know, you know everyone's, he thinks it's all just a bunch of make-believe because they've watched too many superhero movies. Right. Now, I'm not saying we're going to run around, you know, shooting lasers out of our eyes and, you know, w whatever else they do. But there are certain things that we're going to do that Christ can do. And we see just a bit here. Look at Luke chapter 24, verse 27. And, the beginning at Moses, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh into the village whither they went. Of course, this is him walking with the disciples along the road, uh, Damascus Road. And when he made us, he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward the evening, and the day is far spent. So remember, this is right after Christ's resurrection. They haven't even seen him. They don't even re recognize him as Christ right now. And he went in to tarry with them, and it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave it and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. So... It would appear that while he's walking with them, he kind of veiled their understanding of who he was. You know, and then explained to him, them in the scriptures how he, Christ ought to suffer all these things and to be glorified. And then once they kind of came to an understanding of that, you know, but when they sat down for, to eat, God opens up their eyes, you know, gives them the understanding. Then they're per able to perceive that this is the resurrected Christ. And it says there, and their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And then what does it say there? And he vanished out of their sight. And he vanished out of their sight. You know, I, don't, I, I believe that Christ had some limitations before his resurrection. When he came and he, and he took on the form of a servant, and he humbled himself and became a man like us, that there were certain limitations that were placed upon him. You know, that, you know, he had, like the scripture says, that he had to grow uh, in, in, in stature with God and man. Okay? And then he had to grow in wisdom and knowledge and understanding. He was fully God the whole time. Okay? Don't get me wrong. But because he willingly took on these limitations. And there were certain things that he didn't, wasn't able to do. I don't know that before the resurrection he could just vanish out of people's sight. Maybe he could have. I don't know. But we know for sure that afterwards he did. 
that afterwards he's just vanishing out of their sight. So, you know, this is, you know, pretty much teleportation, right? Isn't that cool? <laughs> That's what we get, that ability to just, I believe that. I believe that we're going to, look, the Bible says we shall, see, we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is and that we will be like him. Does that mean we're all going to look exactly like him, like the Rachmanites want us to believe? Or does it mean that we're going to have be like him in the sense that we're going to have the same glorified body in, in Christ, that we're going to have the abilities that he has? I, that's what I believe, and this is one of them. And so what's the purpose of that? Well, remember that those, you know, that we're going to rule and reign with Christ, that those that are you know, diligent and serve the Lord on earth, that God is going to give rewards unto them. And part of that reward is the ability to which they rule on earth. You know, like he gives that parable where he says, you know, well done, thou good and faithful uh, servant. Thou hast been faithful in a few things. I will make thee rule over many things. You know, he, he makes, be thou over ten cities. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Enter thou uh, into the joy of the Lord. Be thou over, you know, five cities. And then, of course, there's the Christian who does nothing and gets nothing in return. You know, he can go sweep the floors or something. So what I'm saying is this, is that if that's our reward to rule and reign with Christ during the millennium, a time when the population is going to take off, you know, the earth is going to have a new form as well, the you know, curse is being lifted, so on and so forth, you know, death isn't, people are going to live much longer, you know, meaning this, that there's going to be a lot of ruling and reigning to do. Now, we're going to live in Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, okay? We're going to be with the Lord in that city. But we're also going to be over certain cities. How are you going to get there? You know, let's say, you know, I don't know that America necessarily is going to be here during that time. That's another big, deep, long subject. But just for argument's sake, let's just say, you know, we're appointed over Tucson. You know, you get appointed over Tucson and, uh, you know, Miranda, the surrounding areas. You know, you lived a mediocre Christian life. You get five cities. Okay. You get, but it's a big one. Okay. Tucson's a big city. A lot to do. It'll be even bigger then if it's around. I don't know that it will be. But, uh, but let's say, you know, for argument's sake, that's what you get. Are you going to take the train from the New Jerusalem over here? You're going to catch a flight? You know, they're gonna, you're going to get, get on Pan Am or something or whoever's flying across the, uh, the, the oceans? That's what you're going to do? No, you're going to do this. Say, oh, I've got some business to attend to in my city. Poof, there you are. Passing out judgment. Ruling and reigning with Christ. Okay, that matter's taken care of. I've got to get over to this one. You're there. That's, you know, you say, that sounds far-fetched. That's the Bible. And I like to think about these type of things because, you know, that's the hope that we have in Christ. You know, and so many Christians, they just drag their life, themselves through the Christian life. Oh, the Christian life is so boring. Do you even understand what you have in Christ? Do you even understand what's, what, you, what you have waiting for you on the other side? Oh, I don't want to serve God. It's so boring. Look, teleporting from city to city, ruling and reigning with Christ, that is exciting. Yeah. And you say, oh, it's just a fairy tale. Then you, No, it's Bible. This is the Bible I'm preaching this morning. <clears throat> now, it go, goes on, it says in verse 32, and they said one to another, this is after he vanishes out of their sight, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they arose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven gathered together with them that were with him, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and it appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way, and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. Look at verse 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. Now, if you were to compare this with John chapter 20, you don't have to. But this, this parallel passage, it says, The same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, uh, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. So Jesus is showing up and the doors are shut. The Bible's being very careful to make us, help us to understand that he didn't just walk in the front door. It wasn't like, you know, Peter in the book of Acts where they're like, It's Peter. You know, like, Did you open the door? No. <laughs> right? This isn't Jesus, you know, knocking and coming in. He's, it, it's just, I mean, imagine how that might, and of course they're afraid, right? That's what takes place here. It says, uh, and it says, and they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. Because who's doing this? 
Who just shows up in the middle of a room? You know, if I were to do that to you, or any one of us would do that to each other, you know, we would probably be a little freaked out. You know, you get, you're at home just eating dinner, having a ca casual conversation over the, over the dinner table, and then boom, Brother Corbin's there. What are you having? <laughs> Got any extra? Mind if I stop in? You're like, I didn't hear him knock. How did he get here? I didn't open the door. Did you let him in? No, the door's shut. It's locked. That's what happens. And look, the Bible's just giving us a glimpse of what this glorified body, this that's gonna that we're gonna have. Those of us that part that are gonna are are going to take part in the resurrection of the just. Okay. Look at verse thirty-eight. He says, and he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me to have. So again, he says, flesh and bones. Saying, look, spirits don't have flesh and bones. I'm not a spirit. I'm not a ghost. I'm not an apparition. I have flesh. I have bone. Right? And he, notice also he says, behold my hands and my feet. He's pointing out the wounds. Okay? So it also, you know, again, would show that we probably do, we're going to bear the resemblance of our earthly form. It's not like you're going to look completely different. It's just that that body is going to be glorified. It's going to have different abilities. Okay? And he says, uh, uh, verse 41, And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they took him a piece of boiled fish and of a honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. So you all can breathe a big sigh of relief, okay? Because apparently there's still eating that takes place, right? We know that in other passages of Scripture it talks about how the Son of Man is going to gird himself, he's going to serve us, that you know, there's going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb, that Jesus said, I will not drink of the wine till I drink it new with you in the kingdom of heaven. You know, that there's, there's going to be eating in heaven. Okay? That, part, that process is still there. We still are able to consume food. Okay? <coughs> Go over to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. So we're just looking at you know, the, just the small glimpse that God gives us of this glorified body and just trying to you know, keep in mind this morning what we have in Christ. Okay? He says in Luke 25, or excuse me, 24, you're going to Acts 1, and he led them out as far as to Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them, and it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. So this is, of course, you know, Jesus' ascension from the earth into heaven. And we get more detail in Acts chapter 1. Now it said there in Luke that he was carried up into heaven. And I believe it's kind of just referring to the way it looked. You know, it was as if someone carried him. As if someone just kind of reached down and picked him up and, and brought him up into heaven. Okay. <coughs> I don't think it was like, you know, like he just went up in a bolt. I believe he, he went up and it kind of made a, a grand exit. Okay. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 9. And when he had uh, spoken these things, uh, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Which seems like a dumb question. Because I just saw a guy go up into a cloud, the Lord. That's why I'm standing here in wonder and awe, gazing. And of course, they're saying, you know, they're trying to, they're using this as an opportunity to say, why are you gazing into heaven? You know, why does this surprise you? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as he's seen him go into heaven. And they're making the point, don't just stand around staring at the sky waiting for him to come back. Get to work. That's the application here. Is that, look, he's coming back again. And it's great to think about the fact that the Lord is risen, that he's in heaven. But you know, it's another thing to also think about the fact that he's coming back. You know, and that it, if we're just standing around gazing up into the, into the sky, when's he coming, when's he coming, and not getting anything done, you know, it might not be as, as, a, as a fun time as we think when he gets here. You know, he might, might be ashamed. He might be one of those people who says, you know, what did you do? Oh, nothing. I just stared at heaven all day. You know, <clears throat> that's kind of the application here. But what I'm trying to get at is this. Is that again, we have this glorified body, we shall be like he is. I mean, he's just appearing out of thin air. He still has the ability to eat. He bears the resemblance of his former body. He, you know, we, there's certain 
the scars and things were there. I don't know that how that all plays out with us, but it will probably be recognizable. But the other thing is, is that he's being carried or he ascends out of heaven. I believe we're going to have that ability that he, we will actually be able to fly, basically. You say, well, that's crazy. Well, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I think it's the truth. I think it's something we're going to be able to do. And I really like that idea, so don't ruin it for me. <laughs> but, I mean, I think that's what he's showing us here. You know, we're showing us that we're going to have certain abilities in heaven, and this is one of them, to be able to just defy gravity to some degree or another. Now, we've talked quite a bit about this morning about the resurrection. And what does this all tie into? This all ties into the fact that this is what awaits people who will participate in the resurrection of the just. There is a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and of the unjust. The just got a lot to look forward to, don't they? I mean, even if you want to take away all that, say, Brother Corbin, you're crazy. You read too many comic books growing up. There's no flying. There's no teleportation. You know, you're not going to be able to do any of that. You'll probably still give me eating, though. I bet you will. You're so carnal, right? Though we'll be eating, though. Well, you know, as long as we can do that. Who cares about flying and the rest of it? Are we going to be able to eat? Yes, we know that for sure. And you say, you know, you don't get any of that. Well, you know, at least you're still going to heaven. There is still that. You're still going to heaven. You're still going to be with the Lord. You're still going to be reunited with everybody. We, the, the, those that participate in the resurrection of the just even if you want to take away all these cool things that I just mentioned, still have a lot coming to them. I mean, we get to enjoy heaven for all of eternity. Okay? But that's just one group, right? The resurrection of the dead, it's two different groups. What about the unjust? You know, fortunately, they don't have any of this to look forward to. None. Okay, go over to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. I'll be getting reading in verse 1. It says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So this is, of course, the end of you know, the, the, the tribulation and God's wrath. When God's wrath is poured out the end of the seven years of, of you know, the three and a half years of God's of the tribulation and then the three and a half years of God's wrath being poured out upon this earth, which we will not participate in as believers, will be taken out in the midst of that. Okay? So this is the end of that, right before the millennial reign of Christ, right before Christ comes back and rules and reigns upon the earth for a thousand years. He's going to bound heaven and cast him, or bound the devil and cast him into the bottomless pit. Okay? Now look at verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Okay, again, that's us ruling and reigning with Christ. Okay? <clears throat> and I saw the souls of them which were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead, okay, so what's taking place here is the, you know, in that, in the midst of that is the rapture. Okay, that's already taken place. Christ has already come back and, 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 and resurrected the dead in Christ. We which are alive have, have been caught up in, to, to be with them forever with the Lord. Okay, and that happens at that midway point. But it says there in verse 5, But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So notice again that you have two different resurrections. You have the first resurrection, and then you have the rest of the dead, which live not again, meaning their, their bodies were not brought back to life until the thousand years were finished, until the millennial res, uh, reign has ended. But notice that those in the first resurrection, the just, are again referred to as the what? The dead. So that's an applicable term. Okay? So referring to somebody, the, resur of the de resurrection of the dead can refer to either group. He says, the rest of the dead. You see what I'm saying? Meaning that those that were resurrected before, the saved, are also considered the dead, the resurrection dead. Anyway, I'm just kind of reiterating that point. But look at verse 6. He said, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On, on, the second death, on such the second death hath no power, but they shall be the priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle. 
the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up upon the breadth of the earth and compassed the, uh, the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down out of, from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead. Okay, and this is talking about the unjust. This is the other part of that resurrection of the dead. I saw the dead, verse 12, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the, jet, the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to works, and death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So the resurrection of the just, we see, takes place after the millennial reign of Christ. Meaning this, that those that are going to participate in that resurrection during the millennium, they're just sitting in hell. You know, there's hell, and then there's the lake of fire. Okay, they're brought up, and they're cast in the lake of fire. People have different ideas about what the lake of fire is. I'm not going to go into all that this morning. But it says death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. So it's like God changes the location of hell and calls it the lake of fire. But this is all that the people, the resurrection of the unjust, have to look forward to. Just that. That's it. No glorified body. No being in heaven. It's just, it's just hell for a minimum of a thousand years and then right into the lake of fire. It's just a brief moment of standing before God in the great white throne, which is going to be a terrifying experience, being judged according to their works, being found guilty, and that's when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of Father. All these people want to deny God, and these atheists, these God-haters, who want to say God doesn't exist, you know, they're going to confess God at that point. It's going to be kind of hard to deny his existence when he pulls their soul out of hell and causes them to stand before him and then opens up the books and judges them. That's why it says, every knee shall bow. The question is, do you want to bow that knee today or do you want to bow it then? You know, it's better to bow it now because then you get to take part in the resurrection of the just because you'll be justified in Christ. And we get all those wonderful things we just talked about. But those that don't do that, those that reject Christ, this is all they have looked forward to. A minimum of a thousand years in hell, and then immediately into the lake of fire. That's why it says they were cast in the lake of fire. I mean, ima imagine what it's like when your kids are getting in trouble. I don't know if anyone does this at home, but sometimes you say, go to your room. You know, go to your room, I'll be in in a minute. You know, a lot of times, they don't, they're not, that's not a fun trip to their room, right? Sometimes you've got to make them go in there. Okay, you got to cast them into the room. We don't literally throw the kids around, but you're trying to get them to go to a place they don't want to go. You know, if, when, when they stand, when the, when the dead stand before God, the unjust stand before God, and God says, lake of fire, you think they're just going, okay, Lord, if you say so. No, they have to be taken and cast. And they're going to go kicking and screaming because they know what's waiting for them. You know, and I've heard, I've heard some theories about what people say that, that this isn't a mo they don't, that they, you know, they, they don't get to even have this momentary relief from hell. But I believe that they do. I believe that they're going to, when they stand before God, they're going to have just, after all that time in hell, they're going to stand before God and just going to be this moment of the physical anguish is going to stop for a moment. They're going to have some sigh of relief. Just a moment. Just to, just to be reminded of what it's like, what they could have had what they didn't have to endure. And they're going to be judged. And, they're going to be, and, they're, and you know what they're going to do? They're going to agree that they're guilty. There's going to be no denying it. And then they're going to have to be taken and cast in a lake of fire. This is the resurrection of the unjust. It's, you, know, you say, well, that sounds scary. It's supposed to be. You say, it doesn't sound fair. Well, you know what? God's ways are not our ways. And we, and we as man, you know, we can't even begin to comprehend the holiness of God. And, and you know, God is a lot of things. You know, God is love. God is all these things. But God is also just. God is also holy. God is also righteous. You know, you say, well, that doesn't sound like nice of God. Well, that's why he died for us. 
That's why the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's not like these people didn't have opportunity. And you say, well, what? maybe they didn't have opportunity. Maybe nobody taught them. Well, maybe we should go tell them then. Now, that's what always drives me nuts about people who want to bring up the hypothetical pygmy in the jungle somewhere. With the guy who never heard. Well, maybe you should go tell him then if you're so concerned about it. Because I'm busy right now telling you. You know, I'm busy coming to your door and knocking you and so trying to you not to get there. Do you have to have a bone in your nose before you're worth preaching the gospel to? Do you have to be some, you know, living in some, the Congo before I can preach you the gospel? How about I get you saved? And since you have such a burden for people who have never heard, how about then you go tell them? And I'll just keep knock, I'll go knock your neighbor's door. And you can go worry about a guy on the other side of the earth. I know I'm kind of going off, but people, you bring up hell, people being cast like a fire, and people kind of, well, I, just, I don't know about that, I don't think. That's not fair. And they're always trying to find cute little ways to, 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 to get out of this. You know, you talk to these Mormons, well, you know, God's going to, everyone's going to get a second chance. The Jehovah Witnesses, oh, they'll get another chance. They're going to be taken out, and the only, the only people that are going to go to hell are going to be people that just co continue to reject Christ. Do you think anyone re would reject Christ after you spent, you know, a, a second in hell? If you just went through your whole life rejecting God, not believing in the, the, the scripture, and then you woke up in hell after you died, you would believe the Bible immediately. Immediately. You go, oh, it's true. And then all of a sudden, you're, you're, you know, at the resurrection of the unjust, you're, caught, you're brought before God, and you see God on the great white throne in heaven. Look, there's no faith required. You know what I mean? They're, they're, they're going to believe in Christ, but by then it's too late because that's not faith. You know, they say, well, I, you know, if God's real, why doesn't he just show up? Why doesn't he just stand here and tell me, you know what, that's going to happen one day at the resurrection of the unjust. It's exactly how it's going to play out. But by then it'll be too late because without faith, it is impossible to please him. We have to come to him in faith, believing that he is God and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. There's no faith required when you've just spent, you know, a thousand years in hell, and now you're staring God in the face. <clears throat> the only thing the resurrection of the unjust is going to exper experience is hell and the lake of fire. And you know what the worst part of that, you know, one of the, another, you know, is this that couldn't get any worse? Think about this. Satan's going to be there. You know, everyone has this idea because they watched, you know, too many Looney Tunes or something that, you know, like the devil's Porky the Pig or something living in hell. They think the devil's already there. He's not there. The devil doesn't want to go to hell. The devil doesn't rule in hell. Hell, God, the Bible says that God made hell for, for the devil and his angels. Not to give them a place to live and hang out, but to torment them. The devil doesn't want to go to hell any more than anybody else. But think about the company you're going to be in when you end up in the lake of fire. Satan and all of his demons are going to be there. And it's not like they're going to be running around. You know, you read these stupid books, you know, Five Minutes in Hell. And they go on how they were in this dungeon and this demon came and took him out and did this to him. It's like, no. Those demons are being tormented every minute as much as everybody else. It's just that you have to be there with them. You know, and I, one of the worst things about hell, I've heard preachers say this, and I always think about it, is the sound of it. We think about, we always think about the fire and the heat and the inescapability. But think about what it would sound like to be there. Just the, the Bible says, you know, there's going to be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And it's not like you're just going to, you know, like when a kid throws a fit, they get it out of their system and just kind of sit there and go, <laughs> you know when they do that? That's never going to end. It's not like you're just going to stop. It's just going to go on and go on and go on. It'll drive you mad. So the resurrection of the just is something to look forward to, isn't it? We like to think about that. And it's, you know, it's something that we, we delight in. It's uh, the hope that we have in Christ. It should encourage us. It should cause us to live for God. It's something that we look forward to. But I'm telling you, the, the resurrection of the unjust, that's not such a pleasant thought. In fact, it's something that should, it's going to bring just dread and terror upon people that participate in it. But you know what? When you consider both of these resurrections, when you think about the fact that the resurrection of the just have so many good things coming to them, and that one, that at the very least, they don't have to participate in the resurrection of the unjust, it makes any suffering that you have to endure on this earth so much more bearable. 
No matter what you go through in this life, you could think, well, I'm saved. You know, and it's cliche and it's easy to say, but it's the truth. You know, and it's something we need to get, a gra get our, our minds wrapped around because, you know, we are going to go through suffering in this life. That's just the nature of life. Saved or unsaved, you're going to suffer to some degree or another. We're going to get old. You know, there's going to be disease. People we know are going to go through things. So on and so forth. Life has its trials and tribulations built into it. But you know what? When we consider this, when we could th consider the resurrection of the just and of the unjust, it makes any suffering we go through so much more bearable. I don't care what you have to go through in this life. It doesn't even come close to what's awaiting the resurrection of the unjust. It doesn't even come close. T take the worst disease you could ever have. Just decades of suffering. I would go, for, I would go through all that rather than one second of hell. I'd rather go through all of that than just even spend a second in that place. <laughs> it makes suffering more bearable. Go over to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, we'll wrap it up here. But it says in Romans chapter 8, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. So oh, you always want that long-lost uncle to come along and leave you a million bucks. You know what? I got, I got something better than that. How about, a, how about you're a joint heir with Christ? How about you have an, inc an inheritance incorruptible, preserved in heaven for you? That's, there's an inheritance, and you know you have it. He says this, We are joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we, we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory of which shall be revealed in us. That's a profound statement. The sufferings which of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Say, oh, the, you know, if we're alive during the tribulation, and, you know, we have to run for our lives, and the, you know, we're being hunted by the Antichrist, and you know, we're, we, we can't buy or sell because we didn't take the mark, you know, we're starving or whatever. What, you know, whatever the worst thing you could think of on this earth, can't be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Yeah. Being like Christ, having that glorified body, being with Him, being with all of our, uh, uh, you know, the loved ones that have gone on before us, being reunited. Can't He compare? I mean, think about it. Whatever you go through in this life, and you get in heaven, you're going to look back, it's going to be laughable. I went through, you're going to say, I, I don't know what my, why I had such a bad attitude through all that. And of course, hindsight's always 2020, but that's the truth. This is the great truth that we have to understand this morning that the resurrection of the just is such an immeasurable benefit that we have. It should make life so much more bearable, whatever we have to go through. <clears throat> Look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. He said, I just want to know more. If I had to give up everything just so that I could know more about the excellency of Christ, I, I, that's what I'm willing to do. And that's what Paul did. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things. I mean, he's suffering on this earth. The same guy that says, look, it can't even be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. When we understand that, you know, we're willing to let go of the things of this world, not just sit there and hang so tenaciously onto them and just think that this life is all we got, that I have to get everything I can out of this life. You know, if you would understand the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, if we could understand the glory that should be revealed to us, you know what that would cause us to do? To loosen up, to let go of the things of this world and not hold so close to them and not get so entangled in the affairs of this life. He says, I have suffered the loss of all things and to count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law but of that which is of the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. He's like, look, I want to know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection I also want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to know what it was like. I want to be made conformable unto his death, being conform made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. He's not saying I have to earn that. He, what he's saying is I want a better resurrection. Go over to Jude chapter 1. Jude chapter 1. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, women received their dead again, raised to life, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Because in the resurrection of the just, we're going to be rewarded. You know, where every man's work shall be tried by fire. 
and, and you know, it will, re it will reveal what manner of work that is. You know, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble. But the resurrection, just not only do you get the glorified body, not only do you get to be in heaven, not only do you get to be with Christ, you get to be with all those that have gone on before us, but then you also get rewarded for your labor that you did here on earth. God is so good. And God makes that available to any one of us that want to just believe on Christ. So he's saying, look, some people, they didn't accept a deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Paul is saying, look, I want to be made conformable. To, I, want to, I want to know the power of his re resurrection. I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings that I might attain on the resurrection of the dead. He's saying, I'm willing to count it all loss. I'm willing to take it all. I don't care. I'll, I'm willing to suffer on this earth because I know it gives me a better resurrection. And you know, and so many Christians today, they don't want to suffer at all. Yeah, that's why your resurrection is going to be about this big. It's not going to count for much. I mean, yeah, you're going to be in heaven. You're going to have that glorified body and so on and so forth. But there's going to, you're going to miss out on so many other things. <clears throat> well, I want to end on this thought. Is that, you know, the resurrection of the just is something to look forward to. It makes suffering something to be, some, the suffering that we go through on this earth more bearable. In fact, it makes it even, from what Paul's saying here, something to be embraced and welcomed. Jesus said, you know, rejoice when, 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 uh, when men persecute you. You know, to leap for joy. You should be glad. But I want us to understand this when it comes to the resurrection of the unjust. That's why it's so important that we preach the gospel. And if there's one thing you could do in this life that counts for all of eternity... It's to preach the gospel to other people. Look at Jude chapter 1, verse 21. He said, keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God. You know what that tells me? Is that you're not just going to be in the love of God automatically. You're not just going to wake up every day and be full of the Holy Ghost and, and, and in the love of God. You have to constantly be reminding yourself of these things. Constantly be rem remembering that there's a resurrection of the just, that there's a resurrection of the unjust. There's a heaven to gain. There's a hell to shun. And that we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, be ye reconciled to God. That's what we are. That's our job. That's why he's saying, keep yourselves in love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ in eternal life, and of some have compassion, making a difference. And oh, what a difference it is. What a difference between the resurrection of the just and the unjust. All these just unmeasurable benefits for the just that we don't even deserve that are just given to us out of the love of God. Compare that to just the eternal suffering of the unjust. I mean, night and day, that's not even a worthy comparison. They're so many miles apart, they're just complete different worlds apart. And that's why he says, keep yourselves in the love of God and have compassion. Don't walk around, well, I'm in the just, which side are you on? Oh, you're one of them unjust, huh? feel sorry for you. Yeah, I remember when I was on that side. Didn't have anything to look forward to. It's going to be pretty bad, buddy. Sorry. <laughs> Is that the attitude we're supposed to have? No, it says have compassion. You say, I, I don't want anyone to go there. I don't, I don't I want them to come out of that. I don't, I don't want them to participate in that. Even, you, imagine your worst enemy, your personal worst enemy. Would you really wish hell upon them? No way. Especially when you consider the fact that we all are headed there and we all deserve to be there. Some having compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. That's not just a figure of speech. Pull them out of the fire. That's, he's talking literally. Because there is a literal fire in hell, in the lake of fire. He's saying, pull them out. How are you going to do that? By having compassion. How are you going to do that? By keeping yourself in the love of God. By, and how are you going to do all that? How are you going to keep yourself in the love of God? Well, consider the resurrection of the just. Consider what you have. And it might just cause you to understand how much God loves you. And it might humble you. We keep ourselves in the love of God by looking forward to our own resurrection. We look forward to our own resurrection, the resurrection of the just. We see everything that we're going to inherit. And that moves us with compassion. To say, look, God loved me so much, I'm going to go out and love these other people and compel them to come in, to save them. I'm going to pull them out of the fire. Let's go ahead and pray.